Hello and welcome to the Formidable Over 40 podcast. I'm Sarah Pittendrig, a mum, award-winning entrepreneur, cancer survivor, mentor and coach. In Series 2 of the podcast, we're sharing new stories along with the ethos that you are never too old and it's never too late to design a life you love. On this episode, I'm joined by Julia Bueno. Julia practices full-time as a psychotherapist in London. Her first book, The Brink of Being, talking about miscarriage, won the British Medical Association Popular Medicine Book Awards 2021 and was the runner-up for the British Psychological Society Book Awards 2021. She has a particular expertise in working with pregnancy loss and infertility and has met thousands of self-critics in her consulting room. Her writing has been published in The Times, The Sunday Times, The New York Times, Psychology Today, and she reviews books for the Time Literacy Supplement. Julia's newest book, Everyone's a Critic, is focused on how we can learn to be kind to ourselves. I'm looking forward to hearing more about Julia's incredible work on this episode of the Formidable Over 40 podcast. Before we do, please do rate and subscribe to the podcast so I can keep sharing more inspiration just like this. So, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Sarah. Good to meet you. Oh, it's great to meet you too. I've given a little bit of an intro there to you. I'm sure there is so much more to share. Would you tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself? Um, yeah, well, I'm I'm definitely over 40. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm formidable. We can come on to what that means for me. But um, as you say, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. um, and I work uh, full time in my private practice in London. Mm -hmm. I used to um, have a bit more of a sort of small ball career psychotherapist working in NHS settings and uh, for uh, charities. And I did work at a university counselling service. But in more recent years, I've just been solely in private practice. And mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, um, that's sort of reflected in both the books that I work in, have written about. Mm -hmm. um, I have sort of specialist interests in. Um, uh, reproductive loss and indeed this pesky notion of self-criticism that runs like a golden thread through pretty much everybody who walks through my door whatever their presenting issue yes um but uh yeah I I, I start maybe worth just as a I started my professional life way back when very briefly as a lawyer um right. a, a disastrous one and I, I sort of gave myself the red card before I think the sisters firm did and and then kind of went um, in a different direction and ended up requalifying in my sort of late 20s, early 30s yeah. to psychotherapy. So I've been at, at that one for a couple of decades now. So to go from law, which is, it's very interesting. So you went in to study law, then took the step back, said, that's not for me, went into psychotherapy. Where did that come from then? Because that's quite a shift. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I studied law at university and I, I sort of did a bit of graduate law Um did a bit of teaching of law uh, so I went a bit even further I qualified as a, a lawyer in practice for a year but all along the way I knew I was bending myself out of shape mm. so I was put on the the law track at an early age through sort of influences around me should we yes. put it that that yeah, yeah, yeah. it it never it, it wasn't springing from my own heart and it took mm -hmm. a very long time for me to to get the courage to mm -hmm. actually be true to myself and and leave um yeah. and psychotherapy was slightly the direction i was tilting toward um for a number of reasons but actually i found myself with the law that i was doing and i ended up doing um what's called private client private client law so i was sort of talking to very high net worth individuals about mm. um their assets and trying mm -hmm. to kind of help them rearrange them in a legal way to be more tax favorably i just didn't care Mm -hmm. about that but what I really cared about was the stories and the people yes. I was meeting and the mm -hmm. the family stories that I was listening to in these rooms so this sort of really piqued my interest into yeah. looking into another direction and eventually that's that's um yeah and that's a brave thing to do because there'll be a lot of listeners who who'll have a share a similar story and I see I in my other life one of my other lives I mentor and and support female CEOs and female founders and it's very interesting as you say there, how many people have follow, did for, for a long period of time followed the path they thought they had to follow, mm -hmm. that they should follow, you know, and it takes, it is a, a, a strength, isn't it? It takes huge strength and courage to say, hang on a minute, 
stop this isn't this isn't serving my purpose this isn't absolutely this isn't giving filling me with passion no. how did you come to that you came to the conclusion because it obviously it wasn't you know mm. giving, giving you that passion and inspiration and energy that you know you get when you're doing something you love how did you manage to make that bold decision what was well, there, you a, know what? was there I, a point I, yeah i mean i literally remember the tipping point mm. um still and this was over 25 years ago um waking up one morning i was living with a friend in a sort of flat chair in london and um washing my teeth very early in the morning and looking at a bar of soap in the, in the sink and thinking if i nibble at this soap and make myself sick oh i really do, I, i've got a genuine excuse not to go to work today yeah and I, you know, I, the one bit of my brain <laughs> clocked that and thought, this really isn't, this is not, this mm -hmm. is, this, this is not the way to live. So, but yeah. I, but I do have to put it in context. I was lucky enough to be, I was then in my mid twenties. Mm. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. I didn't have yeah. any responsibility. So I had a bit of flex in my life to be able mm -hmm. to make that change. And it's, yeah. you know, I, like yourself, you know, it's, it's, it's a different dimension when you want to make a sea change when you've got a lot of other things in place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So to have that, that was the right time. That it was. Pivot. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. So we talk about being formidable over 40 and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And it, and it's, for me, there's the formidable over 40 podcast. The ethos behind it is, is I, I say to everyone, I don't believe you're ever too old. It's never too late. You're never too old. It's never too late to design a life you love. And I speak from my own experience because it took me to be 40 before I feel I found myself and my own voice. And I think 50, I'm 51 now, before I actually found real confidence and that courage to say no when I mean no and to say yes when I want to say yes. And that's a lot of decades to go through to mm. get to, to mm. that point. But I think there's a lot of people get to a point where they, they hit midlife and they think, this is it. This is it. I'm, I'm stuck and, and I've just got to put up. With, I think people sometimes of our generation were told you just put up with your lot. And I don't think you have to. I'm very passionate believer that it is never too late. So that's about the, bringing on wonderful guests like yourself who can share the stories and, you know, inspire people to realize that you are. It's never too late, you know. What does formidable over 40 mean to you? Um, I, I, I guess I sort of echo what, what you've just described, that f for me there's something about um, taking stock mm. and, and marshalling the wisdom that you have accrued over the decades, because we do, just through mm. the living of life, and um, being able to take a kind of inventory of, of oneself and, and ask yourself some hard questions about mm. uh what it is that we are capable of and not capable of and what we want and what we don't want and being being real about that um it, it, and as you say i think it can be if all goes well quite a liberating process to realize mm. that we can say no and we can say yes mm. and and something that you touched on about um when we chatted just put off air about mm, your yeah. introduction about um uh, rain just taking a a, a stock check on the our goals and um, you know what whether they really are in, in alignment with our values. All of this sort of stuff, I think, can come around at that. Um, yeah, in, in in the wake of of living life for a bit, living our adult life for a bit. I I I think I alluded to the word kind of formidable. It was interesting when when I um you first got in contact because. Mm -hmm. Formidable for me is a word that used to have quite negative connotations mm. in my mind for me, mm. because I think I've had accusations in my, uh, and I say as accusations sort of in my twenties, I'm a very different person now to, mm. to when I was then. And, and I could sometimes be described as formidable in quite a pejorative way that I mm. was I had an edge to me. I was a bit spiky, mm. um, probably could be maybe quite unpleasant at times. I don't know, mm. but, um, mm. Whereas now formidable has a different connotation. It's, it has a more kind of grounded quality and a softer edge to it and a, a sort of strength rising out of um, a more kind of compassionate place, I think, yes. than, a, than a defensive, fearful place. Yeah. I don't know whether I, that makes sense. It makes absolute sense. And I think that's absolutely it. And that's why I used the word because Ooh. it has, it, it can mean so many things. 
to so many different people. Yeah. And often, and and again, you, you're the psychotherapist. Oh, God, I'm not telling you what to do, but how many people appear to be formidable on the outside, um, hiding behind that strong smile, but actually inside, they really mm. are feeling anything the not you know anything but formidable mm. um and what what i'm trying to say again with that word formidable it's about using the lessons that we've picked you know that we've gone through these tough lessons that we've gone through through the decades and there'll be failure there'll be adversity there'll be pain there'll be happiness there'll be all so many different feelings and experiences that we've gone through and it's to put them into um into our backpack, if you like, to 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 make us formidable in terms of believing and knowing and understanding that we are never too old, we're never too late because we've got such a wealth of experience now. And that is what will make us formidable. And it's just recognizing it because I don't think some people recognize how far they've come mm -hmm. because they're so busy treading water just to get by. They miss the milestones that have been, you know, sort of what would you call it, sort of, Form the formative, the formative years, and maybe don't realise just how how wonderful they are. And this is a, a bit of a rain check, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so if we go back to you, you mentioned there about your twenties and how different you were then to now. So I like to take my guests back to when they were fifteen, and mm -hmm. you know, what are your dreams? What were your hobbies? What were you doing? And then it sort of takes us onto that journey of where we are today so would you like to share a little bit about where you were well I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to sort of um disappoint you there Sarah because actually I, I my 15 year old self was pretty unhappy right I, yeah I was a, yeah. I wasn't a very happy uh, teenager and mm. I was very lost and I think I already had a sense then of being put on some tracks that mm. as I said you know yeah me being a lawyer started quite early on I think mm. I was very bright at school I was academically very high achieving um and sort of pegged for great things and mm. to go to a top university and all of that which I did but um I I think even then I was I detected that it didn't really sing true so mm -hmm. I think my my dreams and hobbies were rather kind of shackled by kind of just getting getting through yeah um getting through school mm -hmm. yeah and I was very no. happy with my peers and my friends but yeah. um as I say I had a I had an early sense of 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 not really um being in alignment. Yes, I totally resonate with that. I'll have to send you my book. <laughs> I'd love to read it. <laughs> I'll send you my book. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'm really interested to talk about your book, Everyone's a Critic. Um, so rather than me share, or, or, or I'd love you just to share with the, the readers how it came about and, you know, what, what you do in your work, you know, the whole, the whole thing and how you've come to write these, you know, use these case studies and so forth. Sure. Could, would you share? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, um, my, my first book was about pregnancy loss, as you mentioned, and yeah. I was, um, I really, um, I didn't enjoy the writing process at all. I found it excruciating, mm. but I think there was such a great sense of relief when it was published and, um, you know, it, it, could it could be um my sentences made sense and some people liked it and everything so it inspired me um and I think in the wake I, I realized that actually I, I did really um enjoy it and I wanted to do it again mm. um with a bit more confidence so I was scrabbling around for um an idea and it was actually my my husband who's known me for 30 years yeah just said well why don't you write about the next thing that you know so well and mm. I said well what's that and he said, well, self-criticism, duh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which has been a kind of personal cross to bear. And I have done a huge amount of work. And when I sort of say I compare myself now to that 20-year-old self, well, yeah. therein lies the big difference is my relationship mm -hmm. with myself. Uh -huh. So it sprung from that. And I think a lot of therapists and, and maybe coaches like yourself and mentors, mm -hmm. we tend to gravitate towards the areas that, you know, we have done personal work on and we know the best. So yes which in my case is pregnancy loss and self-criticism. Right. So so that was why the idea came about. And I, knowing me as I do, and this is another kind of learning about mm -hmm. kind of knowing what, where, were my, where my strong suits are and where they aren't, I'm never going to be a self-help writer. I, I, I just knew I couldn't write a self-help book. Mm -hmm. um, as you're probably learning already, I'm, I'm 
not very good at sort of bullet point um, thinking. So it, it just didn't fit with my style. So I wanted to somehow write about self-criticism, but in a narrative way. Yeah. So it came about um, the as you know, other therapists like Yalom and Susie Orbach mm. have written case studies. So in a way, I was sort of gifted this protocol of how to how to write about um, how to write about something with this case study um, story format. So they're they're fiction. I've got uh, yes, yeah, I was about to say eight. Thank you. <laughs> Eight. Eight, eight stories um, of, of case of fictional case studies. So they're composites of mm. of all the hundreds and hundreds of conversations I've had with people over the year, and probably bit, you know bits of me thrown in there and mm. bits of people I know, um, where each chapter takes on a a, a different experience of self criticism mm. and unpacks the possible probable. Um, causes that I've come across and talk about a lot in my practice in my practice mm. so for example um, I talked to a, a woman who's um, incredibly self-critical particularly in the workplace and in and in through our conversations we track that back to her um, in fact it's her relationship very much with her, her parents but in particular mm. her father who was very very pushy and expected a lot from her and it was an emotionally very arid house um, I talked to uh, a man who actually strolls in exactly like you're saying about this sort of veneer of formidable. Mm. Actually, I, I experienced him as I write about him, but being quite arrogant and unpleasant and yeah. I really struggle to like him. Yes. But uh -huh. it transfers, as you say, you know, it's a, it's a shield against this very, very um, profound wounding of having mm. been sort of savagely bullied through, yes. through school. Um, and then just, you know, plucking one more. Um, I, the, I, the, only one story is of a couple I work with couples as well as individuals who come to me and and their source of, of sort of um, self-criticism as, as a couple uh, uh, through their experience of not being able to conceive and carry a child, which is mm. something that, you know, my other work tells me that is often a very profound source of um, low self-worth. So, as I say, there are, there are plenty more stories in there, but yes. it, it was through the kind of idea of of, uh, of a, me just narrating a conversation with my clients in the room. Mm. So, um, yeah, the setting is very limited. It's in the four walls of my consulting room. <laughs> it's it's a it's it's fabulous. I mean, I mean, I'm looking forward to getting more into it, and uh, I do find it fascinating. There's something I wanted to ask you. When I told you I'm, earlier when we were chatting that I mentor many female founders and, and entrepreneurs. And what I feel drives them, and I see this in me, it's nearly a, a I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah, I'm going to prove you wrong. So it's a, who am I proving wrong? Yeah, who's the, the you? The, the critics, yeah. Who, who is it we're proving wrong? And so they, they get on and they do that and they get their head down and they, they become hugely successful. Now, I'm not for all you female entrepreneurs listening here, I'm not generalizing. I'm not saying that's everybody, but a number have done it because when we when we drill down, it's something in childhood, whether it's been bullying mm. or it's been a parent mm. or or something. And, it, and it's made them feel like they have to prove themselves. So they've literally nearly driven themselves into the ground, being mm. hugely successful. But what's interesting is that they seem to attract narcissists for partners, many of them, where it's as if they've had partners who, so they're, they're really strong in their business, but at home, they're being walked all over mm -hmm. and they don't seem to have any confidence at home. No, I'm not, this isn't everybody. This isn't everybody. These are just a couple of of conversations you know that yeah. I've had with clients and then sort of you know I don't know what what is that do you, is this something that you recognize well in, I guess in any what, clients what comes up for me as you say that is that that I I think that and yes I have many times come across mm -hmm. conversation through the um dimensional difference if that's too strong a way of putting it mm -hmm. between our professional selves and our private emotional Kind of intimate selves that mm. I, I think that the, the the workspace that can provide a, um, a sort of protocol or a process or sort of scaffolding of of um, achievement and success and gaining power and that there's a, there's a, there's a way to be that is there's a sort of format for it 
um, and people can step into that role. And it, it, I, I, again, going back to this idea, as I described myself, about that word formidable, that mm. often those people who... And it can be driven from a place of, of fear, as you describe. I need to prove to somebody, whether it was my father or actually, you know, and I write about my book, Widening the Lens, as I do. Mm -hmm. I have a whole chapter on in, a, a woman who's internalized so much misogyny and, and racism mm -hmm. that women are up against too in the world. So they might be trying to prove that too. But it's, it's from a place of, you know, um, as I say, kind of driven by kind of fear and needing to defend oneself. Um, but it doesn't deal with what's going on underneath, and that's mm -hmm. a relationship with oneself. And mm -hmm. so back in the private realm, in an emotional, intimate space, yeah. you can lack an enormous, it's perfectly possible to have a, a complete lack of self-worth vis-a-vis, you know, an intimate relationship, which is a very kind of exposing one, mm -hmm. um, rather than sort of stepping on stage and, and bossing it with a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that made sense. It, no, it makes absolute sense. And it's as if the, what, what they're doing is, I don't know, again, if, if this is right, but it seems to me that they're, they're driven and driven and driven. But they get to a point where enough's never going to be enough because they haven't actually addressed the problem. So, so It's a fragile system. Yeah, isn't it? It's like a double-edged sword, isn't it? So it's, it's like the people at home can tap into the chink in their armour mm -hmm. and control them in that home environment. Mm. So... By driving ahead to prove yourself, surely the answer is heal yourself. It is. And then drive yourself it is, to where you want to be. I agree. And it's it's sort of a bit, it can become a, a, a bit addictive to kind of, you know, you get your dopamine hits, but it's such a fragile mm. and and ultimately depleting system. If you're, if you, if you keep thriving well you're not thriving if you keep mm. getting your your little dose of self-worth by you know winning another client mm. or getting a pay rise or you know reach, reaching those targets that are put upon you mm. it, you know it, it's the next and the next and then it's a never-ending cycle and mm. it's very depleting but if that's your only measure of getting a self your self-worth you're kind of trapped in that but yeah. it's it's a bypass absolutely mm. from dealing with what's you know what's really going on why do you need yeah. to keep getting these hits i know exactly that's like, that's exactly it i mean and, there is a parallel with addiction work some now mm -hmm. that i'm talking about this in this way that mm -hmm. it's that you could see an analogy with you know having another drink and uh -huh. getting that or line yeah. of coke or mm -hmm. that's right buying some you know because it is an addiction it is an addiction that money's never enough. Can be, can because be. if you go and like, oh, I want a six-figure business, right? Okay, I've got the six-figure business. Oh, I need a seven-figure business. All right, so I've got the seven-figure business. Where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And what happens when you get to that point, and you go, well, I've, you know, they've basically got to the, each destination, but they've missed the journey. So mm. how if if someone recognizes themselves now, we're having this conversation, yeah, and they're listening and they're thinking, God. Enough's never enough for me. Mm. What is really going on? What is really going on? How can they sort of, what, what do they do? What do they need to do to, to, to sort of break that cycle? Well, ask them, have, have already have, having mm. curiosity about that differential, mm. I think is absolutely crucial. Mm. Um, isn't this interesting that I only feel okay momentarily when I get the next thing? Mm -hmm. um, it, it reminds me as you were, as you were speaking of maybe you've come across the the work of Carl Rogers. You know, he's mm. a very sort of um, along with Freud, one of these very kind of mm. famous therapists who who introduced some really valuable thinking to us. And he talks about these bit of a mouthful, but the external loci of evaluation, internal loci of evaluation. Mm. So um, the the idea being that yeah, the external uh, evaluators are, as we say, the promotion, mm. the car, the nice house, the holiday, the fancy handbag. All of that, but <laughs> but actually, really, what is what is healthy and what we should aspire to is bringing it bringing it inside to mm. to that sense of, and I know this is a podcast, but I'm holding my yes, belly, but yes, you can't yeah. you, you can see me, but that yes. sense of I'm okay. And yeah. That's so so asking someone to be curious about isn't this interesting that there isn't enough of a sense of mm. I'm okay just as I am. On its own, you know, mm -hmm. w without without it being pegged or correlated to 
success or achievement or external markers. Yes, exactly. It's it's fascinating, isn't it? And in terms of um, you know this this self criticism, mm. um, what you know, there's a lot of people very hard on themselves, aren't they? You know, they are very very hard on themselves, I and you know what? What? Why? I mean, <laughs> is life not hard big, enough without being hard on yourself? <laughs> big question, but I th I think it's really tangled up in exactly what we've been talking about. Mm. I mean. So, you know, I'll, I'll start with the kind of macro level exactly that I think we live in a very competitive mm. society that is obsessed with, you know, look, just read the papers. Our budget's all about economic growth yeah. and, and achievement and, and money and, 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 and. So, so mm -hmm. we, we live in this, you know, in the Western capitalist world, I think is, um, I've seen it in my, in my adult lifetime, just as getting more and more. Um, that way, not helped by the internet and social media and all of that. So, mm. so there's 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 this kind of culture of striving and not therefore not being. You know, when are we ever good enough? Yeah. But you know, in the mix, and when I talk to people, exactly as you do, it's sort of mm. unpacking people's stories. But there's 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 often so much more in the mix to mm. um, cultivate the self critical beliefs. Mm these self-limiting beliefs that I'm not good yeah. enough. So yes. yes, there's the culture and the work environment that we're in and the, mm. you know, the target setting and all that. But as my stories in my book try and sort of shine a light on that yeah. there might well be um, stuff going on in the family with mum and dad and siblings mm. or wider family um, or bullying mm. uh, in the school and our, our kind of adolescence is also, I touch on sort of the, whether we, you know, there's a whole other podcast around the effects of kind of social media and oh. and and the internet and what it's doing to our yeah. teenage kids and well, yeah. it's not even just teenagers. I talk to people well in their fifties and sixties yeah. who who um, are affected by their Facebook likes and things mm. like that. But mm -hmm. um, um, and it, you know, as I said, also this we live in a very pro natal society. Mm. And there are also other forces at play. One of my, my final chapter, I, I talked to a, a woman who is um, well over 40 and formidable in a soft, becomes formidable in her soft way, um, mm. who actually had to unpack a lot of internalized judgment and self critical limiting beliefs from a religious background. Right. Um, so, in a very roundabout way, big question why do so many people have self-limiting beliefs there's a mm. there's a whole host of answers to that one but i would definitely say that culturally um of of late when i say you know past 10 20 years and by my reckoning mm. things have been amped up yeah definitely i mean social media like you said there i mean goodness me if ever there was a for the next generation you know this laminated perfect life that is portrayed on there and that's another reason why i wanted to do this formidable over 40 podcast was so that midlife uh, women and i've just had a midlife gentleman would co come on and share the real life stories because it's very easy to look at somebody's destination of where they are and they, they they appear successful and just think god you know that's so far out of reach for me but i think it's important to share the reality of the journey of what's actually gone what people have gone through the decades to get to that final destination mm -hmm. because if you read everything on social media you can become a seven figure mil millionaire seven figure business owner overnight while, you're, while yeah. you're drinking cocktails and lying on a beach in bali do you know what i mean and that's yeah, what they're yeah. telling our kids so our kids are setting themselves up for for fa failure basically because yeah. it's like you know that they're, they're telling them if you can't do this you aren't good enough and if you don't look like this you're not good enough and i think it's so important to to be sharing the reality and the, and the mm. raw and honest stories so that you know i i love to think that kids would listen to this and you know even if they're, they're listening to the parents listening in and think mm. come on then so so these people haven't just appeared you know and, and got this perfect life through you know waving a magic wand that they've gone through huge peaks and troughs of adversity joy adversity joy to get there and it's not plain sailing and by yeah. extension of that we have distorted body images oh, that, you know gosh, yeah. you know we that body was not achieved through eating kale smoothies it's been distorted by the camera lens and yeah it's such a, a complete digression it's not about me but 
you know, I said I was an unhappy 15 year old, but I yeah. thank my lucky stars. I was born in 1972. Oh, yeah, I was 71. Thank <laughs> God we didn't have all that carry on. Oh. Horrendous. Um, I don't and think I would have survived. Filters. That's the trouble. You see, people don't realize these are all there's a new filter on TikTok. And I, I don't know what the hell it's called, but there's this fancy thing now and they put it on and they instantly look like a movie star. You know, they literally it, it looks so natural. You can't tell that it's a filter. And yet it, it makes everybody literally look like they're a movie star. So how do you know if they are or they aren't? So there's this sudden the aspiration that everybody's got to look like this filter. You know, it is. It's a, you can understand why why people are self critical, can't you? When it's like <laughs> that's what you're up against. And I t I touch on this in my book actually. That it just reminds me of like another aspect that that trickles down into people's sort of self limiting beliefs and what they come to to when they first. Quite often, people first sit down on the chair in front of me, and there's a sense of failing because they're there in the first place. Mm. And it's a sort of double whammy. They're kind of criticising that they, their self-criticism. And I do see a link between the again going back to social media, the sort of mm -hmm. the burgeoning wellness industry. And I write about this, which I'm, you know, I'm I'm all for anything that helps anybody. You know, yeah. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't have that that mindset. However, I do see a bit of a backlash that that people are internalising this. People, you know, I. I do yoga once a week and I do 15 minutes meditation and I, you know, eat vegan. kale, <laughs> kale. Exactly. Let's go back to kale. I um, kale. I've, stri I've stripped refined sugar out of my diet. Yeah. I'm still miserable. I'm failing. And it's not yeah. about, you know, it's um, all of those things are good, but again, it's going about, it's, it's bypassing the, the, the real stuff underneath. And, Mm -hmm. And also, there's a. I think sometimes, and I, you have more probably more contact with organisations than I do. That um, organisations can s sort of swerve their own responsibility. You know, yeah. I talk to a lot of people saying, you know, my boss is very kindly paying for this, but okay, that's good. But your yeah. boss is also expecting you to produce, uh -huh. you know, two reports overnight. Yeah. Um. Very all well and good giving you an, a subscription to the Calm app or putting a yoga studio in one mm -hmm. of the conference rooms but let's deal with the fact that you need four more people in your team that's exactly it <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, that literally sums it up doesn't it that sums the whole the whole thing up um you touched on self-limiting beliefs um and you know so many people are held back by self-limiting beliefs yeah. and fear of what people think or what will they say and you know there's a huge lot of talent sitting on the fence because it's fearful of yeah, you know, being judged or you know, actually pushing through that comfort zone yeah. or self-limiting beliefs. Have you ever suffered from self-limiting beliefs? Is Absolutely, it was my downfall. As I said, you know, my husband sort of said, "Look, <laughs> this is something you know about," and and it was the the um, absolute core of my own personal therapy and mm -hmm. um, personal development work, development work. I, I would never have described myself as someone suffering from anxiety or depression, but I would suffer from these very powerful for want of a better word um sort of shame attacks you know i would be gripped by by this so um yeah no, that's definitely been kind of inspiring for the work that i've mm. that i've done i mean i managed to dismantle it because you mm. know going back to what we talked about through my own work and this is very much reflective in the stuff that i i do myself now with my clients is um uh, over time i began to understand that my self-critical belief that could feel so credible in the moment mm. actually wasn't true, capital letter T, mm -hmm. you know, that it was internalized software for, for want of a metaphor, yes. um, that for, for lots of very good reasons, I took in um, the belief that I wasn't good enough. Mm. And, and, you know, my personal story, and what, you know, it was for various reasons that was bespoke for me, you know, everybody's, everybody's story is individual. So, in coming to realise that that you know I didn't and I I, I sum it up that you know, I don't believe any baby is born into the world thinking yes, she said oh yeah. you know my my thigh's a bit fat mm -hmm. for this Pampers uh -huh. um, and so so it was through the kind of unpacking of the possible probable and then what the sources of my self criticism I could recruit all that thinking mm. to then get some space around it and eventually the space got bigger and bigger and bigger until I could you know now and of course my self-criticism hasn't disappeared and sometimes I, I really need it 
you know, I, I cock up all, all the time. <laughs> I do need to wrap myself over the knuckles, but but by and large, you know, I can see it for what it is and, and have respect for it because always our, our self-critical part it was there for, is there as a creation with very good reason. We need to mm. respect it. We need to be kind and compassionate towards it because it was a, ultimately, in my experience, always a defense maneuver from that we created much often mm. in childhood or maybe, mm. you know, maybe not always, but often has a long lineage. Usually, the more tenacious the self-critic is, it tends to have the longer roots. Yeah. Um, so, as I say, yeah, recruit, over, uh, recruiting all that thinking and, and allowed me to just sort of wriggle away from it um, mm. and, yeah, cho choose something. Else. And alongside that process is that was having to kind of re-educate myself mm. to, to the belief that, that a lot of people struggle with, that I, I'm an... Uh, equal member of humanity you know mm. i should treat myself exactly like i do every other human being no, no better mm. but certainly no worse yeah and yeah. that's that's a real biggie for a lot of people that's that you know on on paper that makes sense but actually mm. believing it is yeah. often the real nub of the work getting someone to truly start treating themselves as they would someone else it doesn't even have to be someone that they 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 love or or you know quite often people treat strangers mm. better than they treat themselves. Yeah, and it's about talking to yourself. I always say, you know, I'm always saying this to my son: talk to yourself as you would your best friend. Yeah, you know, lovely. That, you know, it's so important rather than being so hard on yourself. He he's a he rides horses at a very high level, oh, and wow. um, he's very critical. He's only 23, but he's he's achieved so much in such young young life that you know he's really been hard on himself to get to there but and I always say to him I just want him to be kinder to himself you yeah. know he's, he's only 23 speak to yourself as you would your best friend you know and it's yeah it's... oh that's such a lovely mantra and, and certainly one that you, you know I yeah. beat like a drum all the time in my consulting room and mm. there's um you know, in the back of my book, I've got lots of further reading and one very inspirational uh, thinker, writer, psychologist for me is a guy called Professor Paul Gilbert. I don't know if you've ever come across him. No. Well, everybody listening to this needs yeah. to go and buy one of his books, Professor okay. Gilbert, because he is the sort of pioneering thinker on self-compassion in the UK. There are some others in the US, but mm. he... Um, he He's the pioneer behind compassion focus therapy, which is... The, a, a development of CBT, cognitive, cognitive mm -hmm. behavioural therapy. Anyway, um, don't want to get into the weeds of that because yeah. <laughs> we'll be here forever. But the point I was trying to get to is that he's really hot on and he, when working about, when working with self-talk, as you say, um, to to be really mindful about the, the tone of voice you use and mm -hmm. the kind of in, internal sort of creature you inhabit as you say this to yourself. It's It's not going to work if we say, Oh, you know, come on, you're really good. You know, you're wonderful. <laughs> um, it's just like throwing jelly at the wall. You've really got to speak to yourself, but inhabiting that compassionate mm. stance that you would for someone. Yeah. Definitely being kind to yourself. As people say, oh, be kind to yourself, be kind to yourself. I mean, that is, like you say, it's so much easier said than done because yeah. it's not something that's just going to happen overnight it's something that you've got to really work on because it's changing the complete narrative of how you've spoken to yourself for bloody decades well you said it it's about it's rewiring your relationship with yourself yeah, yeah. it's massive Absolutely. and there'll be a lot of women and men listening to this and and they'll be feeling really stuck at the moment you know and they'll be they'll be saying but you know i just don't know how the hell to to get through this you know I, I am lacking in confidence or I have had this adversity that's hit me and I just can't I can't break the pattern of how it's made me feel what is the first step would you say for them to break you know to start the process of of breaking free for reframing for re rewiring whatever we want to call it to help them to to cut loose and move forward what would be the sort of the first steps that they should take I reckon the first step would be a willingness and or, intent, or, or a curiosity mm -hmm. um, around changing. I, so, 
So being curious about the stuckness. I don't know whether mm. this is making sense, yes, but if, yes, it, uh -huh. if if you if if we're defeated by the stuckness, mm. then we're never going to move, are we? No. If we give in to the stuckness, it, it is what it is. And sometimes I do meet people who just say, "Well, you know, that's that's what I'm like." End of. Mm. So you. <laughs> yeah. So so by definition, if you if you're in the space of being curious about working with the stuckness and there's a part of you that can believe there's another way and that things mm. can change then that's a that's a place to start one of the questions i always ask my clients it's one of the very first questions in my program um and i ask them when they last felt happy uh -huh. and that's very interesting because when i ask them that it's like there's a big pause you know it's not like happy's not there it's like Hmm. I've, they've been a someone's for so many years. They've forgotten about being a someone. Oh. And when they go back to when did they last feel happy? You know, some of them, they, they really can't remember. They can't, you know, oh. I ask them, what did happy feel like? And they, they can't remember what happy felt like because I, I don't know. I think it's just in life. Sometimes you can just be carried along, can't you? Carried along. And it's about claiming back some time for yourself as well to, to, to have your own identity. And to do the work, because, you know, if, if you're feeling like this and you're just holding on to it, this is decades of being held back, isn't it? Mm. It's about the sooner you can put that stake in the ground and say, right, enough's enough. It's not going to be easy. I can, I appreciate it's going to be hard, but lying in my deathbed saying, I'm glad I did rather than I wished I had, has got to be better, hasn't it, to, to, to do the work now. So you know, my message is to them to listen to this interview and, you know, start trying to unravel. It's funny because a lot of them, a lot of my clients go back to childhood and say that, you know, they they were told that they were never good enough, you mm. know, by by their parents or they could be, do better. I also yeah. remember my school reports, everyone said she could do better. Mm. And, um, and I often say to my clients, you know, well, what would that look like now? Looking at it through the eyes of an adult rather yeah. than through the eyes of the child you were then about, you know, trying to reframe it. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's trying to get a different perspective on it as well sometimes, isn't it, from how you saw it as a child to to seeing it as an adult. I mean, what can people do if, if they know that something, you know, like before they can come be brave enough to come and see someone like yourself because it does take quite a lot oh, to, gosh, to, yeah. to actually put that state in the ground and say right I'm going to go and see somebody Definitely to try and you know do some of the work themselves what is it that they could do if if they know say for example it's bullying from school if they mm. can take it back and say right yeah I was bullied at school and that's had a, a profound effect on me or my parents were always telling me I wasn't good enough or so and so or whatever what can they do to try and sort of reframe that if you can can you reframe that i i think you can and everybody's different and and some people that might be enough just the kind of aware the you know the curiosity around where did this messaging come from mm. and then realizing oh you know no wonder i beat myself up because i was told i was an idiot for five years in high school mm. In my experience, it's, a, it's actually quite a rare person mm -hmm. who can, that's enough to make a change. Yeah. Um, and I'm not here peddling psychotherapy yeah, or yeah, count, yeah. coaching yeah, or counseling, yeah. or but, but actually, um, if they can find a space, where, as I say, if it's in a talking therapy room or somewhere else to, um, to, to, to go a bit deeper and kind of process the hurt around that, that, mm. that experiencing, you know, when, when we were, bullied for those years or put down for those years or mm. whatever it is that, that we experience great distress and I think that in itself just needs a little bit of processing to be re to be released for one yeah. better word as I say you know sometimes it's just the realization I don't want to be doing this anymore but yes. that's very rare so yeah. so we do need to in my experience spend to do a proper thorough job at this um, you know, one shortcut way of describing that is it, it, it is kind of reparenting ourselves, going back there in our minds and, and properly, by, and by that I mean sort of spending time thinking about and feeling about what, it, what we went through and mm -hmm. how 
dreadful it was and what what deficit there was what we did need and mm. in, in the luxury of a therapy space that might take you know a few weeks or mm. you know in real trauma sometimes i work with people for years of course yeah, yeah, yeah. um so so in answer to your question um i always you know encourage people to 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 be as thorough as they as they can mm. kind of afford it both you know in times of psychological time and yeah um and and you know, as I say, I don't want to be not sort of this is not sort of flogging my book the front and center, <laughs> but you know, in the epilogue of my book that yeah. um that I point to towards lots of um reading and there are lots of other kind of resources out there now outside of therapy that can help us um make compassionate inquiries into our past and, and mm. really kind of get to the the root of our um wounding. Yes, the wounding is the word, isn't it, really? Because that's what it is. Wounding, isn't it? Um it's been an absolute pleasure oh. chatting to you. I've really, I, I've really enjoyed it. This is something oh. that I'm absolutely fascinated in. What is the biggest piece of advice that you would give to someone who's listening in and embarking on a journey of reinvention? They've, they've listened to this podcast and they feel inspired. They said, right, that's it. I've had enough. I'm sick of feeling stuck. I want to, you know, I realize now my life's, it's not over. It's all to play for. What advice would you give them? things things always change that is one kind of universal truth that mm. things change and, and your feelings will change and it is it is possible mm. to change and it is possible for the light to be to come over the horizon but but be patient I think that's super important because most people I talk to it that if you're feeling really stuck I'm mm. just very long answer to your question that's there's an urgency I want to change I want to change now yeah but do it to do a proper, thorough, lasting job that's going to stand mm -hmm. you in good stead for the rest of the you know few decades ahead. Yeah. Um, be patient and be thorough and and do your proper inventory. You know, go as deep as you possibly can to mm. to um, to to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, going back to that that mantra about you know awful kale smoothies, but <laughs> but drink the kale smoothie while digging deep inside of you and get and get to that wounding. So, yeah. yeah, patience and faith. Yeah, patience and faith. That's absolutely fantastic. Honestly, thank you so much. Thank you I so much for having me. I really enjoyed this, Julia. Now, uh, for anyone watching on YouTube, this is the book, Everyone is a Critic. Now, Julia, where can um, the listeners find out more about you and more about your book? Um, I have a website, which is my name, juliabueno.co.uk. Um, you don't know much about me because I, I don't, but I, I post things that I read and um, my book will be in any good independent book sh bookstore. Mm -hmm. I should be plugging independent bookstores or, <laughs> yeah. or any other obvious places on the net. But thank uh -huh. you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. It's been girl. lovely thank talking you. to you and I, I love what you're doing. So. Oh, that's really kind. Good thank speed. you ever so much. Thank you. So thank you for listening to the Formidable Over 40 podcast. Thank you so much to the wonderful Julia for joining us. Head to the show notes to find links to connect with Julia and get a copy of her book. Follow the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please subscribe, rate and share Formidable Over 40 with anyone you think will enjoy it or needs to hear it.